Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has an interesting title, Biblical Missionaries. Could you pick out missionaries from the Bible? Well, this lesson is going to talk about an interesting couple of missionaries, the people we call Esther and Mordecai. Remember that story? This is lesson number six in that series for August 8th of 2015. And uh, we're going to have some interesting discussions about Esther and her experiences. <coughs> but before we begin, we'd like you to join us in bowing your heads and asking God to guide us. Our kind and wonderful Father, we ask now that you will direct as we talk about this incredible experience or these incredible experiences of so long ago. There are many things we don't know about these stories, but what we do know teaches us that you are an intimate part of everything that happens here on this earth, and we ask now that you'll be an even bigger part in our lives each day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just to be honest and realistic, the story of Esther and Mordecai is a very challenging one for Bible-believing Jews and Christians. We do not know why Mordecai and Esther were working in Susa, the winter capital of the Persian Empire. After the Jews had been given permission at least twice to return to Jerusalem, instead of moving west to reestablish themselves in Jewish territory, for some reason, either Mordecai and Esther, or maybe their, rel their ancestors, had moved east to live in Susa. As an orphan, Esther was taken in by her cousin Mordecai and apparently raised as a faithful Jew. The rest of the story raises a lot of questions. If you have not done so recently, read the book of Esther. It will not take very long, and it should raise a lot of questions in your mind. Well, these events happened at what point in time in history? 5th century B.C. Early in the 5th century B.C. That would be about 483 down to 473 B.C. What else was going on about that time? Well, it was the Medo-Persian government that was ruling the world. They were trying to suppress and conquer the Greeks, which they never succeeded in doing. And finally, the Greeks, under Alexander the Great, 150 years later, conquered them. But uh, the, the Persians had a couple of disastrous campaigns against the Greeks. These events in this book occurred between those recorded in the 6th and 7th chapters of Ezra. So dating the book of Ezra, Ez, I'm sorry, dating the book of Ezra, is a bit challenging because the first six chapters he's reviewing what's happened in the past and then he goes on and so these events fit in that gap. Xerxes I, who ruled from 485 to 465 BC, was a king of Persia and the husband of Esther the Jewish is, is a part of the story. Ahasuerus, which is the other name for Xerxes, why does he have those two different names? Anybody know? One Greek and one Persian. <coughs> one is an attempt to go directly from Persian to English, and the other is an attempt to go from Persian to Greek to English. And it's the same name. It's just <laughs> the way it got to us. Now, Persia, what would that be? Iran. That would be Iran. That's Iran today. Okay, the Book of Esther portrays the king as ruling a vast empire, being very wealthy, being sensual, continually giving feasts, being cruel and acutely lacking in foresight. In 465 BC, a courtier murdered Ahasuerus. His son, Artaxerxes I, Longamanus, succeeded him. So Esther's husband was ultimately murdered by one of his sons. The chronological data supplied by the book of Esther as follows, and you can see the chart here if you look up on your screen or part of it anyway. We can date many of the events in the book of Esther even down to the precise day. That's how well 
the, 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 the chronology is known at that point in, in history. And the interesting thing is this, that the reason they were had that long, well, the reason they had that long period of preparation and then they had great feast is because Xerxes was getting ready to go on a long, almost a year-long campaign against the Greeks. While he's gone, Esther, and of course, there was a, the thing with Vashti and so forth. While he's gone, Esther is being prepared to be the future king, queen, I'm sorry, the future queen. He comes back, and then they have the beauty contest. Well, they comes back, and then she's ready to, to come to him and so forth. So the people who want to make these Bible characters not historical just myths need to account for the fact that it fits exactly historically with the facts we know about the history of Xerxes. Um, and yet we don't have any extra biblical source that names Esther or Mordecai right. or Haman. That's correct. Or these specific events. No, we don't. <coughs> We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. And those of you who want to uh, look into some more of the background behind this, this Esther, whole, Esther story, look at the, the teacher's guide for the book of Esther in our, at our website on www. Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. There's a lot of fascinating history behind this book. We don't know exactly why Esther was chosen in the beauty contest. She probably did not have any choice in the matter. Probably they sent out some men to look around, who are the best looking women around, and said, you and you and you and you and come with us. Probably that's about the way it worked. And these were probably teenagers? Very young. Mean the women? Yeah. Probably. Maybe early 20s. You don't think Mordecai said, hey, you ought to give this a shot? I don't think so. Well, what does it say to us about God that he continued <clears throat> to lead and guide her under those circumstances? Well, think about that as we move on. When Esther was chosen in the beauty contest, Mordecai advised her at least twice to hide her identity. Is that being deceitful? Look at these two passages, uh, Esther 2, 10 and 20. Now on the advice of Mordecai, Esther had kept it secret that she was Jewish. That was verse 10 and verse 20. As for Esther, she had still not let it be known that she was Jewish. Mordecai had told her not to tell anyone, and she obeyed him in this, just as she had obeyed him when she was a little girl under his care. So that's an important point to notice in this discussion because she's going to be pretty faithful to Mordecai's instructions even though she's now officially a part of the harem of a queen. This isn't very uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego-like or Daniel-like. They were put it all right there on the, for everybody to see. So now Instead, what are we supposed to learn from Esther's story now? Well, I don't know, maybe maybe some things we need to unlearn what we discussed with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> Do you think that um, <clears throat> just because she didn't mention it that she's deceiving by doing that? What do you call that? I would call if, they, if she actually said, I'm not Jewish, that would be deceiving. But okay. if she doesn't say anything, it's up to them to figure it out. Didn't and if they don't... Didn't she, I mean, if she's in the harem there, she's getting food to eat. Isn't she eating some of this food that's offered to idols? <clears throat> You're asking a lot of questions. Well, they're well, good ones. <laughs> are there, well, let's, let's bring it down to our day. Are, are there times in our day when we, it would be wise for us not to mention that we're Christians? Well, I don't know. We just studied Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it seemed like the lesson there was you're not supposed to hide things. That, you know, in fact, by placing yourself in uh, these controversial circumstances gives you an opportunity to witness. If you were in Syria right now and you were a Christian, would you want to make it widely known that you were a Christian? 
Well, I don't know. And Daniel and <laughs> his three friends were in Babylonian. You know, of course, everybody knew already, but... Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things in my life the Lord didn't tell me it was going to happen. It was a good thing he didn't, because I wouldn't have gone through it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a lot of well, stuff. There's, all... there's a lot of stuff that that you just don't know about, even though the knowledge is there. When I when I first read that a few years ago, I thought about Abraham when he asked Sarah to lie. I thought it was just to save, you know, basically save her life. But there was so much more at stake, you know, because later on she's gonna do so much more for her people. So I figured that there was some deeper meaning into not telling. Mm -hmm. So the ends justify the means. I think so. I'm not a Kantian. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm a Kantian. Yeah, I'm not a Kantian. A lot of other things come to mind when he told his wife not to to tell him to tell the king that she was what his sister. Time. That's kind of a well. It was still a truth, wasn't it? But a deceptive truth. Well, it was what? all the information was there. Okay, uh, now so hold on. Let's just be very <laughs> frank. If you, for whatever reason, you were placed in a position where you were supposed to witness as a Christian in a Muslim country today, would you start off right up front, front by saying, I'm a Christian? I'm going to be like Daniel. Now you have to feel your way around That's a little bit. something outright in this scenario. She's purposely withholding information that she knows, had they known, they would act, treat her differently. So in your scenario, you're outwardly proclaiming something when nothing's asked of you. In this situation, she's purposely withholding something, knowing that, had that truth come out, they would act differently. So what would have happened if they had discovered she was Jewish? No beauty contest for you. No she just go back to back to her little village and maybe. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere. I don't know if it's true or not that the process of getting her ready for the contest took a long time. Yeah, it did. She had to, okay. So maybe during that time she wasn't supposed to tell because they wanted her to become the queen. Something. I don't know. She had a group of people taking care of her. Yeah. And and she was pretty much had her own. I mean, you asked about the diet. But in her group of little people who've taken care of her, she could pretty much have whatever she wanted. And again, I, I mean, we can we can hold all our Daniels up in front of us and that kind of stuff, but <laughs> seriously, now in a communist, I mean, in India now, there are provinces, there are states in India where it's against the law to change your religion. Yeah. And the Christi Christianity is growing most rapidly in those places. Why is that? During the Holocaust, was it uh, appropriate for a Jew to go up to yeah. one of the SS troops and say, I'm a Jew? Yeah. No. No, no it doesn't make sense. Well, <clears throat> let's, let's take an example. How about using Jesus as an example? John 4, he's talking to the woman in Samaria. And what does he say to her? Well, of course, there's the discussion about water and says living water and so forth. He says, well, we know that the, Jew, the Messiah is coming and so forth and the Jews believe in him and so forth. And he says, I am he. But he didn't tell his own people that, not even his own disciples. Or the road to Emmaus. Yeah. Why, why would he do that? They would have killed him earlier. <laughs> well, there were even times when there were certain healings and so forth he told People not to Person, tell. Yeah, don't, don't tell anybody what's happened here. But he wanted I'm, the, I'm there may have been some other reasons for that. But yeah. He wanted the disciples and everybody else to think and, and evaluate and qualify everything that, was, that, that they learned rather than just, oh, they have the one and then they, they, yeah. they, their thinking would stop. I, I, I'm going to go a step even beyond that. <coughs> Is it because Jesus recognized that if he told the Jewish people that he was to be their Messiah, they would have had a complete, or they had a completely wrong idea of what the Messiah was going to do. Yeah. And I quote, this is Desire of Ages, page 190. Christ was far more reserved when he spoke to them, that is the Jews. That which had been withheld from the Jews in which the disciples were afterward enjoined to keep secret was revealed to her. 
Jesus saw that she would make use of her knowledge of bringing others to share his grace. So maybe there are times when we need to keep things secret. The thing that amazed me is I stumbled across a book recently and what you don't necessarily pick up from the Bible in Christ's time, in his time that he was living, there were multitudinous imposter messiahs yes. that gave Rome fits. Mm -hmm. And there's another reason why he would have kept quiet. There's, there's, it, one after the other, there were bits. And virtually all of these guys thought that was their job, as messiahs, their job was to raise an army and fight against the Romans. Romans, and some did, mm -hmm. and that's what brought it all to a head. Yeah. There's a, it, it, there's a quandary here, um, especially as we've discussed Daniel and so forth. Uh, you have to ask the question whether the message is here it's appropriate to keep secrets sometimes, or this is what they did. And God, nevertheless, was able to work things out in the end. So, it's all right for Jesus to do that, too? Um, <laughs> well, be careful. Right? I'll have to think more about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go to Esther 3, because we don't have time to go to all details of the whole story, but let's get right into the plot. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted a man named Haman to the position of prime minister. Haman was a son of Hamadatha, a descendant of Agag. Okay, what do we know about Agag? Oh, what? He was <laughs> a king? Yes. Wasn't he, was, he the king that... He was supposed to have been killed, killed by yes. Saul. Right. Uh, and Centuries okay. before. And Samuel, and instead he took him captive and all the sheep, and uh, Samuel said, What's, what do I hear? Yeah. I have brought offerings for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it was so. Not, it was the, not, and this is a puzzle for the for the Jewish folk down here at the uh, Museum of Intolerance, I would think. But anyway, <clears throat> the the high priest Samuel told Saul to go out and 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 eliminate Agag and all of his kin, and not just the soldiers, but they were supposed to kill all the soldiers, all the women and children, all the dogs, all the cats, all the sheep. It was a scorched earth policy there. Mm -hmm. These were the Amalekites. Mm -hmm. and, it turns uh, out that Agag... And, 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 and he didn't. No, he so didn't. So some of them uh, continued to survive, and this Haman is one of those guys, century later, who is remembering this. Mm -hmm. and wants to get out, even. <laughs> it turns out that Agag is a name for the king of the Amalekites, like Pharaoh was the name for the king of the, of the Egyptians. So we don't know exactly where he was in that line, but so it turns out that, and, and by the way, what so tribe... What, so what you're saying is that, that this could have been an Agag, a Pharaoh much later. Mm -hmm. Is that which may not have been the one? Well, I'm just saying that he. What we're saying when he says he's a descendant of Agag, he's a descendant in the royal line of the Amalekites. I see. Okay. okay. So. so now, where is that going to take us? Now let's 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 go to now to the next step. What where did where where did Mordecai come from? Do you know what tribe he belonged to? I assume it's the tribe of Judah. I'm going to guess Benjamin. No? Benjamin. So he might have been a descendant of King Saul. <laughs> so here are ancient enemies. And so now, now that raises questions. When Haman was appointed to be a vizier prime minister of the king, Mor Mordecai refused to bow to him when he passed. When Haman discovered who Mordecai was and why he did not bow, he was furious. Haman's ancestors and Mordecai's ancestors had been enemies for many generations. Early in the history of Israel, King Saul was supposed to have eliminated Haman's ancestors completely back in 1 Samuel 15. Haman was a direct descendant of Agag, one of the kings of the Amalekites. No doubt he thought this was a good opportunity to eliminate his old rivals. So, what's going to happen? Well, look at verses 8 through 13, chapter 3 again. So Haman told the king, 
there's a certain race of people scattered all over your empire and found in every province. They observe customs that are not like those of any other people. Moreover, they do not obey the laws of the empire, so it is not in your best interest to tolerate them. If it please your majesty, issue a decree that they are to be put to death. If you do, I guarantee that I will, I will be able to put more than 340,000 kilograms of silver into the royal treasury for the administration of the empire. That is a lot of money. The king took off his ring, which was used to stamp the proclamations and made them official, and gave it to the enemy of the Jewish people, Haman, son of Hamadatha, the descendant of Agag. And thus the plot thickens. Okay. So was it that much silver because there were that many Jews, or because they were that rich, or both? Well, because the, the king and his high officials had a lot of money. But, but this is, I, I assume this is, he was going to take it from the Jews and put it in the king's treasury. Yeah, oh, probably. Yeah. yeah but the, 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 the plundering king, later. Yeah, but then the king more. says, ah, oh, keep your money. That's a really say. He was greasing the king's hand right up because there were a lot of Jews. It says further on there were Jews all through the kingdom and Haman wanted them all killed. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. Mm -hmm. So where were most of the Jews in the days of Esther? We would in call Persia. Mesopotamia. Oh, right okay, across. two groups of Jews. When, when, when Jerusalem was conquered finally and the, the, the country of Judea was completely overrun and, and, and just splintered to pieces, some of them were taken, some of them, a, small, a relatively small group fled down into Egypt. Most of them were taken into Babylonian captivity. So most of them went over to, to Babylon, Mesopotamia, between the rivers and over in that area. Then when Cyrus became king, what happened? He let them return. Let them he, let said, some return. he said, you can go back if you want to. And how many returned? Not Probably a, about one or two percent. Yeah, not many. Returned. <coughs> Later there was some, a, a smaller group that returned. Maybe seven, eight thousand, something like that. Returned. And this was, what, 70, 80 years later? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a whole generation of people a whole couple, three generations in a way, if you consider 25, who have grown up in another culture, who have established their homes, speaking different language, don't remember what the temple looked like. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but now Esther and Mordecai are not only, not only did not go back to Jerusalem as they had been invited to do, but they had moved further east. They're now in Persia, not in, not in Iraq, they're now in Iran. No, is that due to because they were conquered and carried off again, or did they just decide how did they get over there? I mean, didn't we, didn't didn't the Persians and the Medes do the same thing with their enemies, plus or minus, as the Babylonians in a similar way, but maybe a little kinder? Well, we don't. Uh, maybe they out carried some people off. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, you're, you're kind of assuming that going one way or the other is kind of a toss-up, but it's it's not. I mean, going back to Jerusalem would have been a hard life. They would have had to build up from nothing. Mm -hmm. They would have had to, and and we find out in the Bible that they started building their homes instead of the temple, mm -hmm. and and. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't just easy to go back. Okay. Was it? Well, no, I, I, I'll admit that. But the question here is this, where did God want them to be? If you're a faithful follower of God, aren't you supposed to be where God wants you to be? They're well, supposed to be missionaries over in Persia. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the <laughs> title is. <laughs> well, what do you think of a God who goes to such lengths to deal with people who maybe aren't where they're supposed to be. Now think about the story of Esther. Which Jewish tradition or custom and law she, did she not violate? Can't think of any. What? 
Ask I mean, that you think, again. Do, you, do you think a good the, Jewish girl is supposed to be married to a pagan king? She's supposed to be sleeping with someone that she's not married to. <coughs> well, to you said as introductory remarks, she probably didn't have much choice. Well, it was probably you, you, and you. Yeah. Of course, she could have done the Daniel thing, like I pointed out earlier. Yes. I'm Jewish, can't marry you, and you don't want to marry me. Do we have any evidence that any Jews were ever required to go to Persia? No. Well, 118 years before this story begins, Mordecai's and Esther's relatives had been carried captive along with jo Waki, uh, Jehoiachin and Ezekiel in 598-597 BC. Sixty years before this story, Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest had led 50,000 of the Jews who were willing to go on the journey, quote, home to rebuild Jerusalem. Another large group of Jews were in Egypt where they had fled, taking Jeremiah and Baruch with them, and read about that in Jeremiah 43, especially verse 6. Only a very small percentage of the Jews were actually in Jerusalem where God apparently wanted them to be. Well, we just talked about him dragging them all off to Babylon and spreading them out because there was a purpose for, so now they don't, God doesn't need them anymore. They've done all they can do, and so now they need to go back to Jerusalem. We're looking at all the theology here. Yes. Well, why do you think Mordecai was over in Susa? Is it possible that he was supposed to be representing the Jews over there? It's possible. Sometimes we've suggested, I can remember being told this when I was young, if you go to places where God doesn't want you to go, the angels don't accompany you. They wait. Maybe outside a building somewhere. And when you come out, they start taking care of you again. Is that how Esther and Mordecai were treated? Well, think about the lost story of the lost sheep, the prodigal son. Well, does God ever leave his children alone, especially when they're in particular danger? I don't think so. His children may be ignoring his advice and counsel at the moment and even ignoring the persuasion of the Holy Spirit and his assistance, our guardian angels, but that does not mean that God has abandoned them. Numerous examples could be given from scriptures to show that God is, goes out of his way to reach out to help and touch us if there's any possible way that we will respond. But now seriously, shouldn't God have solved this problem with uh, over there in Susa with uh, maybe a, a prophet or a prophetess or some wise person like Jonah instead of using a beautiful young woman who becomes the wife of a pagan king? He could have done the dreams thing again. Yeah, why not? Maybe God called a prophet and a prophetess or several prophets and prophetesses and they didn't, they didn't uh, heed the call and he went down the line and here's Esther and she heeded the call. Maybe. Well, the whole story is a little bit different than most of the other Bible stories, isn't it? That's different. Uh, like, is God mentioned? God is the name of God is not mentioned anywhere in the entire book. How about prayer? Is prayer? No, prayer is not prayer mentioned. Prayer is not. Now, if you, it's, it's, in the, it's in the good news, but I think if it's you, not, If you, if you read a lot of the modern versions, they will put prayer in there because yes. it's fasting and, the, and prayer is sort of implied, but it doesn't actually say prayer. In the originals. So it's, in the original. It's kind of a secular story too, isn't mm -hmm. it? Comparable the Bible. That's why some people wonder why it's even in the Bible. Well, yeah, some people do. And the people in the, <laughs> the people in the dead, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they wouldn't have anything to do with the book of Esther. Has great irony, though. Mm -hmm. Great well, irony. Modern Jews certainly place a great deal of credibility on it because this is, uh, they celebrate this the event, even Europe. today. Well, I mean, if, if you, if a, a foreign government, a powerful foreign government plans to wipe you out entirely, and someone saves you, do you think you would celebrate? 
Mm -hmm. Wasn't the term Purim just, wasn't it just rocks with numbers that they used? W we don't know exactly how they did the casting of lots. Huh. Possibly, yeah. But anyway, Purim means lots, whatever it means. Yeah. So. Well, according to our modern standards, our Christian standards today, who in this book should be a here one? Which wouldn't it be Vashti? Hmm? Should be what? Shouldn't she have been the heroine, Vashti? Why? Well, she refused to show herself off before a bunch of drunk men. No, that's kind of the setup to the story, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why? <laughs> you need a setup to the story, and that's what set it up. Yeah. If I had a daughter, I wouldn't want her to act like Esther. Or I should say my daughters, I don't want them to act like Esther. I would okay. rather have them act like what we know of Vashti. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, some comments. Herodotus names Xerxes' queen as Amestris. Her name was Amestris. Now remember, Herodotus was, used to be called the father of history. We now realize that Herodotus was really more like a storyteller. He was writing stuff for his, for his Greek audience, so not, he's a pretty unreliable character. But anyway, he describes her as infamously cruel. Suggestions have been made to identify her with either Vashti or Esther, although philological and historical arguments for either are unlikely. More likely, Vashti and Esther were wives of Xerxes or Ahasuerus, remember those are two different versions of the same name, that Herodotus does not mention. It should, should be noted that although Herodotus is often called the father of history, he wrote primarily for, from interviews and with the intention of entertaining and to glorify the Greeks. His work is far from faultless historically. Therefore, it is improper to, put Hero to pit Herodotus against the Bible, because assuming that the Bible to be an error where it is in inconsistent with Herodotus. So, why, why do you think Mordecai refused to bow to Haman? Let's get to the real meat of the problem here. Yeah, he's an Amalekite. Is that the reason? That's it. I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> why was he supposed to, why, why was, what was this bowing thing? Was this something that Mordecai or uh, uh, Haman uh, instigated or was this something Probably. that was responsible, one did because of that was his position in the, <clears throat> you know, Haman was, a, was a, an official as well in the, in the court. Mm -hmm. Very likely on a par, or maybe even, I don't know, is it clear whether which one of these was more superior? In their, in their you know, was one a captain, another a private, or? No, we don't know. Well, the way I read it, Haman was uh, above, uh, he was prime minister, yeah. basically. He was, yeah. so he was clearly above Haman. Yeah, clearly above, above Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, according to Jewish tradition, in the Targum Sheni in Josephus Antiquities, volume 11, 6.5, Haman was a direct descendant of Agag, king of the Amalekites in the 16th generation. There is no mention made of Mordecai refusing to bow to the king. There are numerous records in scripture of Jews bowing before kings. For Samuel 24, 8, for example, and others who are regarded as superior to themselves. Haman was a Gentile, but Abraham bowed before Gentiles, Genesis 23, 7. Mordecai, of course, refused to offer Haman the kind of reverence that is due only to God. Did Mordecai put all the Jewish people at risk by his action? Yes. It was clearly a matter of considerable attention because Mordecai's associates spoke to him about it on a regular basis. Look at Esther 3, verse 4. At day after day, they urged him to give in, but he would not listen to them. I am a Jew, he explained, and I cannot bow to Haman. So they told Haman about this, wondering if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct. So this is, I mean, you know, this is the guy that tells Esther to keep his identity secret. But boy, he's not being, quite, not being secret about his identity. So how would you feel? Let's just put ourselves in the story. How would you feel if you just had heard of Mordecai's edict signed by the king that
that all Jews were to be destroyed and you knew it was because you refused to bow to him. You'd have to find that out first. Yeah, I mean, obviously he did. He did, yeah. He was in sackcloth. Well, there was a... But do you think that Mordecai... Uh, Mordecai... <laughs> Uh, you think he he wouldn't bow to anybody, or it just just um, Haman? Uh, we don't have we don't have any evidence that he refused to bow to the king. Yeah, it seems like he'd get in worse trouble if he did that. Yeah, but I don't know. Maybe they wouldn't care that much. There was a kind of a similar situation with Moses. He went to Pharaoh and said, "We're leaving," and. Pharaoh said, no, you aren't, and now everybody's going to have to make their bricks without straw. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a similar type thing in a way. The consequences of an entire group of well, people suffer because of... Whatever the situation, Mordecai felt that for some reason that he could not bow to Haman. We don't know whether it was just stubbornness, whether it was animosity, whether it was part of his religion, or maybe nothing more than personal choice. Which happened first, this or when he was by the gates and heard they were going to kill the king and and That help. happened first. Okay, that happened I, I do find it difficult to believe that to Mordecai would, would not bow unless there was a legitimate reason here. There was mm -hmm. just because he was an Amalekite or, or, or something there was, there was Something comes across here that Haman has overreached his Are there authority. Other? However, it does say, I am a Jew, so. Yeah. Are there other uh, times in biblical history when uh, attempts were made to wipe out the Jews? Yep. Did he well, <laughs> kill all the boys in, in Egypt? In Egypt. Kill all, okay. the bo kill all the male children in Bethlehem. Yes. What was the purpose of those decrees and who was behind them? The arch deceiver. He's, this is almost certainly a direct result of the devil's work. I mean, he thought, boy, he knew the Messiah was coming. You talked about, well, in Genesis back there, Genesis 3.15, we can get the hint that God is planning to do something. <laughs> and Satan is going to, trying to do his best to make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah, but did it come through this line? Did it come through Esther came through the Jews, yeah. Well, I know, but there were Jews every place else, too. Yeah. I would think he would be kind of smart enough to be able to track, track the genealogy. And, I mean, if Jesus wasn't, the Messiah wasn't coming through this group of Jews or through Esther, more well, I, I, don't, I don't know, did it cut it? This decree uh, by Haman was to <coughs> eliminate Jews throughout the... Whole world yeah. that they controlled, mm, not just Susa. No, no, far, far wider than that. And they talk about well, I know cities. But did, did, did the Persians have control of Egypt at this time? Did they have control yes. of you know? They were, were they control wherever the Jews were? They had control of it. I see. Um, <coughs> maybe Mordecai knew more than we are told here in the Bible, but it's quite obvious that Haman was a conniver. Mm -hmm. He was working yes. his way up, and he didn't care who got in his way. And maybe this kind of thing had been going on earlier. Okay. If you had given, been, if you had been given the king's permission to counteract the first decree of Haman, what would you have written or done? Was Esther partly responsible for the kind, kind treatment received by Ezra and Nehemiah later? How much difference in time was there between Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah? This is a chance for you to really pull out your thinking cap and <laughs> a review. handful of years. Yeah, six, eight years, something like that, between the end of the story of Esther and the stories of, of Ezra. So there's and no the story of Ezra being significant in, in what way? Well, he was given special permission to return with a group of people and with, with, with a lot of the king's favor and a, a lot of money to help him do the things he needed to do when he got back there. To, to Jerusalem. 
to rebuild Jerusalem. Re rebuild the temple and establish the community back there again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> probably either neither Ezra nor Nehemiah had direct contact with Esther because as part of the king's harem, she would probably have been pretty much isolated with only to him. But they, they must have known about her. Well, Artaxerxes Longamanus, the next king, was the third son of Xerxes and his successor to the Persian throne. It is very unlikely that he was a son of Esther, but at least he would have known all about her. He was a king who granted the generous gifts and positions uh, to Ezra and Nehemiah to help rebuild Jerusalem. So that's another outcome from this story. So now, let, let's come to some really pertinent questions. Why do you think Esther and her friends fasted? Because they couldn't use the word prayer. <laughs> <laughs> because they wanted to give up something in order to receive something else. This, this, uh, this is a way to try to get God's attention? I think so. Well, there's, there's tradition to fasting. I mean, yeah. they were just following the tradition. It can produce clarity of mind as opposed yeah. to numbing from alcohol or feasting and so on. Uh -huh. Yeah, but if you deprive yourself of food and water for three days, you don't oh, have... Oh, it doesn't say anything you're depriving yourself of water. I think I read that and said, said food and water. Well, I don't, I don't know anything about the water part. Well, there are people that fast today that don't know the reason for at least what we understand. Gordon mentioned it had to do with, you know, there's a clarity of mind that kind of, and a certain spiritual uh, alertness and so on and so forth. But I, there are people that fast today because, I don't know, they seem to, that's what they used to do in the olden days when, mm -hmm. they, when they did that. And, you know. It, and we certainly couldn't tolerate even a minor absence of food, right? It could, it could be, and it's reasonable to argue that that's why they were doing it too, is because, now who, once again, who was it that fasted here? It was well, Esther and her group, whoever she's working with, and she told the um, Mordecai to go and tell all the Jews in, Jerusalem, in, in, in Susa, mm -hmm. presumably to fast and pray. So it's a kind of a ritual of signifying supplication or or in the minds of many. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's a, it's a ritual, that, some ritual. That so what, is it com what do these rituals accomplish? <clears throat> I don't know. Rituals are funny to me. I don't, I'm having a hard time understanding what rituals are for in a lot of ways. But Well, Esther ended up inviting Haman and the king to a banquet. And then what happened? She spilled the beans. What was happening? Well, hold on. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the banquet, the king said, well, what, don't you want something? And she says, well, I'd like you to come back tomorrow, right? And what happened that night? The king couldn't sleep because he'd eaten too much or drunk too much. So Esther, was, Esther may have been serving too much uh, alcohol <laughs> in addition to everything else that she did. <laughs> and when the king couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, he said, "Bring me the history records." Mm -hmm. And there he was read to him the story of Completely Mordecai. Completely boring, right? Pardon? Completely boring. Yeah, that'll put me to sleep any day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now the king can't sleep, so he has the records read to him. And what hap What does he hear? Mordecai saved his life. Uh huh. So next morning. What happens? Tables get turned. <laughs> but the king is very, he's very, uh, what's the word, I want cunning about how he did it. Yeah. He calls Haman in and mm -hmm. asks him Well, he says, he, he just asks, you know, I, wanna, I really want to do something for this person who's, who saved my life. Is there anybody out there? Yeah, there's somebody here. Come on in. So it was Haman. And Haman was asking, he wanted to ask permission to do what? He wanted to hang Mordecai. He wanted to hang Mordecai. Had a, yeah. had a gallows built that was, what, 75 feet tall or something like that. 
So, what happened? Or Paul. <laughs> king asked him what, what he should do if he, wanted, if he, the king, wanted to honor somebody special and mm -hmm. as a reward. Because and? Haman thinks he's the one in line and he <laughs> spouts out what he thinks, so he tells him to go and get Mordecai. Can you imagine, try to imagine yourself in Haman's position? Try to imagine yourself in Mordecai's position as they're being shaped, you know, through the, through the city of Susa. Is it fair to say they were both a little bit cunning? <laughs> you know, if, if people were <laughs> telling the story, there would be laughter right then mm -hmm. because it's so ironic what happened. It kind of makes yeah. me wonder about how this story well, was put together. Look at Romans 1, 18 to 20. God's anger, keep that in mind, <coughs> is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. God punishes them. That, and now notice the name of God is mentioned here again, but in the original it's not there. God punishes them because what can be known about God is plain to them, for God himself made it plain ever since God created the world. His invisible qualities, both His eternal power and His divine nature, have been clearly visible. They are perceived in the things that God has made. So those people have no excuse at all, and, and, and so forth. So, why are we quoting that passage? I don't know, why are we? <laughs> well, it's commonly understood, and it's believed by most Christians, that when God gets up, when you do enough bad things and God gets upset with you, he's going to zap you. Is that the kind of people, person we, we worship as God? Just like he did to Haman? Well, what about that? <laughs> most people, uh, most Bible translators approach the Bible as uh, some sort of a code book. How do you get out of the trouble? Because God is going to get you if you step out of line. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's they don't approach from the standpoint that God is love and God never changes. Mm -hmm. Of course, it could be argued that God wasn't responsible for what happened to Haman. That was, that was um, the, the Persian king's preference here. I see. Well, we know it in, Rome, in the Romans 1 passage, it says, what does it say about God's anger? How does God's anger manifest itself? Look at verses 24, 26, and 28. Romans 1, just a little bit further down. And so God has given those people over, the famous Greek word is paradidomi, to do the filthy things their hearts desire, and they do shameful things with each other. Because they do this, God has given them over to the shameful passions. Even the women perverted the natural use of their sex by unnatural acts. Because those people refused... Hold on here. I found uh, Psalms 81, uh, verses 11 and 12. Uh -huh. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would have none of me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. I mean, this is all through. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ezekiel 20, 25, and 26, I've brought that up many times. I found the RSV is a terrible translation. Mm -hmm. The, RS, the uh, um, older version of the NIV, I gave them over to laws that were not good. They were defiled by following their, the, the practices, and it was to abhor them to make them that they, knew, they would know that I am God. Mm -hmm. It's just a, another example of God giving them over, Hosea uh, 11 and uh, Hosea. Romans 1. Okay. So... We have here a passage that talks about God letting people go to reap the consequences is that of their own behavior. Is that what happened to the, to the uh, Esther and crew? Well, Haman, for sure. Well, look, well, if, you, if you're going to use that line of thought, then you could, it could <clears throat> a natural <clears throat> uh, conclusion might be that the Jews were in this predicament here in Susa and throughout the land because they hadn't headed back to Jerusalem when they should have. That's what a lot of people would say. 
One interesting side note in all this is found in Esther 3.13 compared with Esther 8.11. So let's look at those two verses. 3.13. Runners took this as Haman's proclamation to every province of the empire. It contained the instructions that in, on a single day, the 13th day of Adar, all Jews, young and old, women and children, were to be killed. They were to be slaughtered without mercy and their belongings were to be taken. The contents of the proclamation were to be made public in every province so that everyone would be prepared when the day came. So what's supposed to happen to the Jews? Annihilate them. Execute. Yes. Annihilate them and help, help yourself to their goods, right? What's, what's Adar? Is that a month? A month, an able month. Yeah. You know what month it is? It's, uh, uh, the Purim is end of February, the first part of um, March. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, compare 8, verse 11. These letters explain that the king... Now, this is Jew. This is um, Mordecai and Esther's version of the decree. These letters explain that the king would allow the Jews in every city to organize themselves for self-defense. If armored men or of any nationality ever in any province attacked the Jewish men, their children, or their women, the Jews could fight back and destroy the attackers. They could slaughter them to the last man and take their positions. This decree was to take effect throughout the Persian Empire on the day set for the slaughter of the Jews, the 13th of Adar, the 25th, I'm sorry, the 12th month. And then how would that really help? I mean, there must have been a whole lot of other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Jews were, were not the predominant people here. No. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> How how was that how was that really 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 going to be very effectual if that became a necessity? Well, I mean, it's still the Jews would be annihilated. Yeah, but look at what happened by contrast. Look at Esther eight eleven. These letters explain that the king would allow the Jews in every city. Now, this is what Esther and Mordecai wrote. These letters explained that the king would allow the Jews in every city to organize themselves for self defense. If armored men of any nationality, da 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 da, but they could slaughter them to the last man and take their possessions. So now the Jews are given permission to do what? Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. But we go down to chapter nine, verse ten, and it says, "Among them were the ten sons, the people who were slain." It talks about all the sons of Hamadatha. However, there was no looting the king james i mean my good news bible says there was no looting did they plunder the ter the property according to the that verse it says they didn't you go back up to uh, chapter 9 verse uh, 17 the last half of 17 and many from the peoples of the country declared themselves jews for the fear of the jews had fallen upon them mm -hmm. <laughs> as a so rapid what, conversion what, wasn't it what kind of <laughs> what kind of jews were they Smart ones, mixed multitude types. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the well. We chuckle. The decree that this is Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, page six hundred five. The decree that will finally go forth against the remnant people of God will be very similar to the, that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews. Today, the enemies of the true church see in the little company keeping the Sabbath commandment a Mordecai at the gate. The reverence of God's people for his law is a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling on his Sabbath. You know, it could very well have been that had uh, the Jews not been given permission to defend themselves, the only real, there have been two kinds of people that would have attacked them, the Amalekites, mm -hmm. who would be, be thrilled to have this opportunity, and then, uh, you know, generalized thugs or people like that. It's like, it's not like everybody in the Persian Empire was going to attack necessarily the Jews. Yeah, <clears throat> well. Well, a little another note in, in terms of history. Both ancient Jews and Christians disputed the right of the Book of Esther to have a place in the Old Testament canon. It did not appear in the Old Testament used by the community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls nor in the Old Testament of the churches of ancient Turkey or Syria. The name of God does not appear in the book of Esther, while there are 190 references to the heathen king. There are no references to sacrifice, temple, or worship, 
although fasting and prayer, it says here, are mentioned. Finally, the covenant emphasizes on for, empha, covenant's emphasis on forgiveness and mercy is not mentioned, and yet the Lord saw fit to include it in the canon. Why? What powerful spiritual lesson can we take from it about how God can work in our lives for good, even amid what appears to be very difficult circumstances? That, of course, is a part of our Bible study guide. Does, do we do we ta count on God to work with us even in very difficult circumstances? Yes. Well, I, I think there's lots of. I mean, for one thing, this was a uh, a universal assault on on the Jewish people who were going to be the the source of the Messiah. So God is watching out for that. Yeah. Um, now the lesson, he doesn't abandon these people completely. Um, he can work in all kinds of uh, uh, difficult circumstances if they're willing people to, to do the best they can. Let me take one more running out of time. Let me take one more <coughs> quotation from Ellen White. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appear as dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold behind, above, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and power and passions, the agencies of the Almighty One, silently, patiently, working out the counsels of his own will. Education, page 173.2. So, what do we see? Is God working behind the scenes here in the book of Esther? Yes. Yeah. Do you have to read between the lines to see how he's working? No. Paul, remember, said that you have to be, you know, <coughs> he was willing to be all things to all people so that by all means he might win some. Is that what Esther was doing? You know that, well, we don't have time to mention that, but anyway. So in the Bible we have the stories of Esther, Joseph, Daniel, who are serving in foreign governments, undertaking the king's work, and yet they stood out in their honoring of God. Will the time come for some of us to do the same once again at the end of this earth's history? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these privileges we have to come and talk about your word, to represent you before those who are listening. May those who need to get this message, need to hear this message, may they be uh, drawn to it as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.